science fans and welcome to Xi'an Shop. Today, we continue our genetics and molecular biology series by focusing on the topic, cloning. We're clones. We're someone's experiment and they're killing us off. The concept of cloning has the world amazed. And if you look at how it's portrayed in the media, just a little bit afraid. What most people don't understand, perhaps, is that cloning is not necessarily an artificial thing. In fact, it happens inside your body all the time. Your body clones its own cells whenever it needs to replace old and dying tissue, or if it needs to repair damaged portions. This process is known as DNA replication and occurs in the nucleus of your cells. The process of DNA replication begins with the unwinding of the DNA double helix. Imagine this as zipping down your zipper, except that the zipper is twisted upon itself. This unwinding is facilitated by the enzyme helicase. It unzips the DNA and exposes the unique nucleobases on the inside that can now be copied. Now, while the helicase is busy unzipping the DNA, the rest of the 3 meters worth of DNA is busy being stressed. So what does the cell do about that? A molecule called gyrase relaxes the supercoiled portion, and one mechanism that it does this is by creating a tiny cut in one portion and assisting the strand to untwist a little and sealing it back up. Another enzyme that works in tandem with helicase is primase. Primase attaches complementary RNA molecules to the DNA called primers, and they serve to mark the start of the portion to be copied. You can think of primers as tiny start here signs for the subsequent molecules that will be involved. And the next molecule to be involved is DNA polymerase. There are many types of DNA polymerase, and the one that is needed here is DNA polymerase 3. The DNA polymerase 3 complex recognizes the RNA primer and attaches the complementary nucleotide to the unwound DNA strand. DNA synthesis through DNA polymerase 3 can only happen in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. This means that for a new nucleotide to be attached to the former, the phosphate in the 5th carbon or the 5' prime carbon has to be attached to the 3' prime carbon, and it goes on and on, but only in that specific direction. Since the helicase travels in only one direction, and a DNA is a double helix with anti-parallel strands, the replication process will have a leading strand and a lagging strand. The leading strand follows the direction of the helicase as it unzips the DNA with the DNA synthesis again in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, while the lagging strand goes in the opposite direction of the helicase and is discontinuous, but is also occurring in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The short fragments of newly synthesized DNA in the lagging strand are called Okazaki fragments. They are usually 100 to 200 bases long, because in order for new primers to be attached, the DNA should be spaced out a little bit. Once replication is almost complete, DNA polymerase 1 replaces the RNA primers with DNA nucleotides. Together with the separated Okazaki fragments and the RNA primer replacements, this leaves a portion of the newly synthesized strand unlinked with the rest. The enzyme ligase is responsible for linking these portions with the rest of the new DNA strand. Some of you might have noticed that I mentioned DNA polymerase 1 and 3. But what happens with DNA polymerase 2? Well, DNA polymerases 1 and 3 are the only ones involved in normal or regular DNA replication, while DNA polymerase 2 is involved when it comes to DNA repair when mutation or damage occurs. Also, DNA polymerases 1 to 3 exist in organisms that are called prokaryotes, single-celled organisms with no membrane-bound organelles, more commonly known as bacteria. 
things get a little bit more complicated in eukaryotes as there are at least nine types of DNA polymerases known with various functions. But going back to cloning, DNA replication is a natural process of the DNA copying or cloning itself and it happens all the time whenever you need to grow, develop, or repair certain parts of your body. DNA replication is a prerequisite to the cellular level of cloning that happens, which is called mitosis. Mitosis produces the needed cells in your body to replace the old ones or to repair damaged portions. Another natural instance of cloning would be identical twins. Identical twins are formed when a fertilized egg cell splits into two or more copies of itself which results to the formation of two or more children that will each possess an exact copy of the genes of the other. Of course, identical twins will not necessarily grow up to be exactly the same person. How we are as an individual is shaped by both our genes and our environment. Apart from that, over time we accumulate random mutations throughout our DNA and this will be unique per organism. By the way, not all twins are clones of each other. Fraternal twins exist wherein a mother ovulates twice in a reproductive cycle and each egg cell is fertilized by a unique sperm cell. Although both children develop at the same time, their genetic makeup are completely distinct of each other. Recently, it has also been discovered that there could be semi-identical twins. Semi-identical twins form out of a split embryo that has been fertilized by two unique sperm cells. Since the splitting will cause the genes from the two sperm cells to be randomly assigned, the resulting children are not fully identical. Plants clone themselves naturally too all the time. Every type of asexual or vegetative reproduction in plants that comes from the root, the stem, or the leaves results to a clone of the original plant. Runners, rhizomes, and adventitious buds all produce new plant bodies that have the same genetic content as the original plant. The natural process of plant cloning is so efficient that as farmers, we even took advantage of it. For example, Cavendish banana trees, wherever they are grown, are clones of each other because they reproduce through cuttings or suckers. Bananas can't sexually reproduce anymore because they have three copies of their genetic material. So, they cannot undergo the process of meiosis, which produces sex cells. They're left to clone themselves in order to multiply. The irregular number of chromosomes that are present in bananas is what causes it to be seedless. And since that discovery, Farmers have started to look for varieties that also have irregularly numbered chromosomes to look for seedless varieties of different fruits and vegetables. So, a seedless fruit or vegetable is not necessarily created from the lab. It's actually created through the natural or traditional process of genetic modification that our farmers have done for thousands of years. And this is called selective breeding. Now, despite the thousands of years that we've been cloning plants, whether consciously or not, the concept of cloning only became an issue when Dolly the sheep was formed. Dolly the sheep was made by fusing the nucleus containing the DNA with an egg cell that had no genetic content. The fused cell successfully started dividing and was transplanted into the uterus of a foster mother and then eventually, Dolly was born. This was the first time that an obvious human tampering of the genetic process was done, and it freaked people out. Ethical repercussions of applying the same technology to humans has yet to be resolved. But shrewd capitalists have since then taken advantage of this technology in agriculture. Owned cows, pigs, and goats abound in the US and the UK. Since they are just copies of exemplary but naturally occurring organisms, food products from them are safe for consumption. The cloning process, after all, simply does away with the uncertainty of getting lesser quality meat or milk after the animals are allowed to breed.
And to appeal to our sentimentality, some labs have even offered to clone our dogs, cats, and other household pets. So having genetically identical plants and animals mean consistently high-quality products and produce. This can also mean the same level of adaptability to environmental problems and diseases. The lack of genetic diversity of these plants and animals mean that they will either all succeed or all perish when threatened by extreme temperatures, pests, or disease. Of course, humans are being cloned now too, but probably not in the way you think. Stem cells can be harvested from newborns and grown, while basically cloned in the lab to serve as a backup supply of organs and tissues that can replace faulty ones as the child grows up. It is a miraculous technology that can solve a lot of diseases without sacrificing a donor. This method of cellular propagation or cloning has even allowed us to study the mechanisms of cancer growth and treatment. This technology immortalized and kept alive cervical cancer cells from Henrietta Lacks, a 31-year-old African-American mother of five who died of cancer in 1951. Cells genetically identical to those taken from Henrietta Lacks in 1951 are still alive today and found all over the globe. They are called the HeLa cell line and has since then allowed us to understand the biology of cancer and the effectiveness of certain treatments for the disease. I hope I've been able to clarify certain myths about cloning in this short video. But just to make sure, let me summarize and reiterate our major points. Cloning is not always artificial. Natural cloning occurs in your very cells and happens frequently in plants. Since the advent of agriculture, we have been artificially cloning plants through vegetative propagation. The lack of genetic diversity in cloned plants and animals makes them vulnerable to climate change and disease. But this doesn't mean that if you plant a cloned plant in your farm, then all of your other plants will become clones. Hindi po nakakahawa ang pagiging clone. Stem cell cloning and the propagation of cell lines are efficient tools to understand disease and find new ways of treating the untreatable. I hope you were able to learn something from this short video on cloning. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and also subscribe to our channel for more science goodness. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, please don't hesitate to message me, your resident Filipina scientist, in the comments section below. Thank you very much, and see you around!